Okay, this video is about Dr. Shirzai, quote unquote, corrected. And I'm kind of playing around here because both of them are highly educated. They know a lot. They're both neurologists. They both did research. They both did extra fellowships. So they know a lot of stuff and they had to study a lot of stuff and they got a lot of experience with cognitive impairment patients. So I'll give them credit for all that. And I'll also make a confession. I'm a little jealous of them. They get to live in California, around Los Angeles, in one of the blue zones, Loma Linda, where the Seventh-day Adventists are. That's a great place to be. And Loma Linda is famous for being one of the great um, centers for research on neuroscience. So all of that is good. Um, they wrote a book called Alzheimer's Solution, and it got big praise from some famous people. Will Bolshevitz said they are the world's leading Alzheimer's experts. T. Colin Campbell, author of the China Study, said this is the best, most professionally informed book of its kind. Um, Rip Esselstyn said stupendously smart and all these other compliments. Rip Esselstyn, he won't even interview me. Um, so I'm a little jealous. I have to be honest with that right from the beginning. Okay. Um, what else? They're a nice couple. You know, they're good looking, attractive people, highly articulate. Um, they look healthy, They're, and the way they act around each other is good. They're nice to each other. They communicate well, um, and they're good about it. They recommend a plant-based diet. That's good. They say that plants are better than pills. They have videos where they're going through all the stuff uh, in the pantry and you know, showing, talking about the pros and cons of each food. That's all good. Um, they have a reasonably good understanding of nutrition. Most doctors don't know anything about nutrition. Um, what else? They know all the conventional stuff about dementia, like in the conventional papers, and you know that's good. Um, now, where do I see some minor problems? I think their videos are kind of dumbed down. Like I talked about, Neil Bernard almost talks at the level of a IQ audience in '95, mostly just to women. Almost it seems like he's talking. McDougal about to an audience of about 110. You know, I'm used to talking to doctors all the time, so I talk to like a doctor level audience. Let's say average IQ of 125, 120, 125. Um, so I thought, I thought their videos were kind of dumbed down, but I actually went to their, their website. I think it's like braindocs.com or something. And their website I thought was much better. They have a blog where they've got a lot more information. They've got links to all kinds of research papers. And here's my advice to Dr. Shirzai. Why don't you make more videos based on your blog and go into some of these scientific papers? Okay. And then there's a little bit of a joke there. They don't, do you think your audience is stupid? But no, but here's the joke. If you're taking care of demented patients, if all your patients are cognitively impaired, none of them are going to ever read a paper. But of course, that's not really the entire audience. A big part of the audience, like the ones who watch the video, are probably people that are cognitively normal, even above average, definitely, because they're the only ones that have the curiosity to seek out information. And they would like to see more advanced information. So, okay, so what else do they do that's good? They tell people, you know, the truth. You can dramatically reduce your risk of dementia by avoiding the same risk factors that you avoid for cholesterol, hypertension, and diabetes. Um, and that's an important point. And I like the fact, too, they don't BS the audience. They tell people, look, if somebody's got, you know, full-blown dementia, there's no cure for that. If it's, if it's sort of a conventional vascular dementia or so-called Alzheimer's, um, so they don't lie to people and give them false hopes and try to sell them, you know, some bogus supplement. So they're honest about that. That's good. Um, and that's the main thing people can learn is start early, you know, start, you know, as soon as you can, definitely by your thirties or forties at the latest, if possible to get going on preventing worsening of cholesterol, hypertension, and diabetes, which tend to be the main risk factors that lead to dementia. I looked at thousands of brains and I can tell you at least 90% have hypertension and diabetes and another 5% have one or the other. And who knows if the other one wasn't even in the chart, but they probably do, um, and cholesterol, of course, is a major risk factor for atherosclerosis. So all of that is good. Now, what criticisms do I have of them? Well, some of the stuff they're doing, they have to do it. Doctors are obligated to say and do certain things. Like, for example, one of the quotes they made was, oh, Alzheimer's disease is about 65% of dementia. And I realize in conventional circles, you kind of have to say that. But personally, I don't think it's true. I think Alzheimer's is kind of a joke, kind of like the Loch Ness Monster or the Bigfoot or the Abdominal Snowman. And the reason I say that is, you know, there's a neurologist, a guy, pretty famous guy by the name of Alberto Espe, who did a lot of his research in Parkinson's disease. He wrote, he wrote a book called Brain Fables. And the gist of it being Alzheimer's 
is a disease where there's no historical finding. There's no question you could ask the patient to confirm they got Alzheimer's. There's no physical exam finding to confirm a diagnosis of it. The blood tests are theoretically coming along, some of this PTOW and other stuff, but it's not that definitive. There's no uh, definitive brain imaging finding. Theoretically, you know, atrophy of the medial temporal lobe and parietal convexity, but I almost never really see that in any type of significant way. Um, then they'll say, what about the nuclear medicine test? Very expensive, you know, to, to check for the amyloid, for example, or you can do a PET scan, decrease glucose uptake in parts of the brain, but... You know, that's pretty overrated. Even at autopsy, they find lots of these beta amyloid plaques in normal people. And then they came up with the post hoc, you know, cognitive reserve theory, Notre Dame, Notre Dame nun study out in Mankato, Minnesota, which is sort of like a way to, to protect the Alzheimer theory and beta amyloid and stuff. And so what I'm saying is, and then there's no treatment for Alzheimer's. So once it's diagnosed, really. So what I'm saying is if you can't diagnose the disease and you can't treat it, isn't Alzheimer's kind of a joke? And, you know, they do mention that, you know, vascular impairment seems to be more and more the money in Alzheimer's. I think it's the big money in Alzheimer's. And, of course, if you got risk factors like cholesterol, hypertension, and diabetes, those are exactly the main risk factors for atherosclerosis, that and high serum ferritin, for example, and a couple other ones. Wouldn't it be the case maybe that Alzheimer's, what is, what is called Alzheimer's is really vascular dementia. One of the problems is you look at the brain MRI, and when you see these patients, most of them don't have that many... Um, strokes. They don't have, certainly they usually don't have a convexity, large infarct, cortical infarct. Um, they often have a little bit of periventricular flare hyperintensities. Don't get me wrong. Some of them have a lot of uh, flare hyperintensities, which is sort of a medical way of saying silent strokes or small strokes. But I see lots and lots of demented patients that have very little, minimal, mild or minimal periventricular, deep white matter, subcortical flare hyperintensity. So what I'm basically saying is there's a lot of patients who don't have much evidence of having, ever having had a stroke or infarcted brain. And so why could that be? And I'm telling you, it's like Delatore's mouse theory, okay, of tying off the carotid arteries, the chronic cerebral hypoperfusion theory, that these brains aren't getting enough blood flow and they're just progressively atrophying. And the way the neurons are dying is through apoptosis, whereby they go into programmed cell death. They can't meet their energy level demands. And programmed cell death, apoptosis, is a slow death, whereby the neuron can recycle itself, its internal contents, its organelles, in comparison with a sudden stroke, with a big artery occlusion and a massive uh, sudden onset hypoxia of neurons, anoxia of neurons, where they die suddenly. That's called necrosis. The plasma membrane lyses and they spill out all their contents and nothing can be recycled and it's a big mess and you can point your finger on the brain MRI exactly where it happened. There is the stroke. Whereas apoptosis, you can't see it on a brain MRI. You can't see it on uh, autopsy other than, you know, relatively speaking, a paucity, a lack of neurons. Okay, so other things. Okay, getting back to these guys, the Shurzai doctors here. Um, they never mentioned Jack Delatore, PhD. He's the guy who wrote the book Alzheimer's Turning Point. That's the book ever, best book ever written on the subject of dementia. They never mention it. Nobody mentions it, okay? And people should because it's not talked about in conventional medical circles. And so what am I telling the Shurzai doctors? You guys are both real smart. Why don't you read some of these books that are a little bit out of the conventional circle because they're great. Delatore's work is brilliant, okay? Uh, and also watch my videos if you like on uh, cognitive impairment. You'll see that I'm a smart guy. I mean, I don't... I wish I had time to do research. I work full time as a clinical doctor and I tried to get some of my stuff published and you know, my theories, but they get rejected by the journals. And then what happens is I work all the time. I would love to be in a research institute. I wish a research institute would hire me. You know, I'm like watching and crick. I'll read all day long, every single day. I love studying all this stuff. And I know there's tons of good information in all these papers, but there's nobody to put it all together. The PhDs can't put it together. Most of the people doing research don't really have that wide of an education and they can't connect things, whereas I can. Um, let's see, what else? Del Torre is well known. I'm not that well known and I know that's the case. But they have, they've had a chance to see my videos. They had a chance to see my video, Chef AJ on Dementia, for example. Um, let's see, what else? I never hear him talk about Tetsumori Yamashima, which is an interesting guy. He's a Japanese guy who wrote all about omega-6 cooking oils undergoing lipid peroxidation and how he thinks that's the major reason why the incidence of dementia is going up in Japan. I never hear them talk about excitotoxicity. That was popularized by John Olney and by Russell Blaylock. That's a very interesting subject. I think that's totally under-recognized as a major cause of neuronal death. And I say that for very good reasons, which I explain in all my videos. 
And then they never talk about circa inhibitors, sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase inhibitors, or mitochondrial inhibitors. Both of those topics popularized by me, and I'm the one who sort of popularized and explained and figured out the concept. I mean, everybody, there's a lot of researchers that know about excitotoxicity, that know about circa inhibitors, that know about mitochondrial inhibitors, but I haven't seen any papers where somebody puts them all together like I did. Uh, I'm the one who figured out they're all basically the same thing. You end up in the same place, an apoptotic dead neuron when you have an excessive amount of excitotoxicity, circa inhibition, or mitochondrial inhibition. Okay, what else? I never hear them talk about Douglas Kell and Etheresia Pretorius. They wrote, they made really good uh, videos about a leaky gut being connected to dormant bacteria accumulating in the blood with subsequent reactivation due to ongoing iron overload, for example, uh, with subsequent release of their endotoxins like LPS from the gram-negative bacteria, L LTA from the gram-positive bacteria, and that leading to an unusual form of blood clotting where you've got like an am amyloidogenic transformation of the fibrinogen. And instead of getting um, your sort of more standard blood clot, if you will, they get a uh, transition in the proteins from a alpha helix configuration to more of a, a beta-pleated sheet stacked up polymerized configuration. Okay, anyways, it's interesting stuff. Um, and they believe that contributes to the beta amyloid mechanism of Alzheimer's. Okay. The other thing is they recommend nuts and flaxseed, which I'm not so sure about. I know that nuts get a lot of positive publicity, especially in the Seventh-day Adventist community. There's other people like McDougal who says that publicity is industry-funded indirectly. Flaxseeds, I'm not too big a fan of flaxseeds. They're super, super, super estrogenic, many thousands of times more estrogenic than other foods. And they're also real high in fat, and uh, so I'm not too enthusiastic about that. They contain a little bit of cyano, um, so I'm not thrilled with that. They also sort of indirectly recommended salmon. Now, they didn't come outright and recommend salmon. They come and said, well, some people think that's a beneficial thing, and it does have omega-3s, but they kind of downplayed it a little bit. But I think they should come down a little stronger. They should say, no, fish is a bad idea. It's got mercury. It's full of fat. It often gets fried. It's often cooked on POFAS types of uh, cookware, etc. And, you know, part of what I'm getting at here is they run a business, okay? They want to attract patients. They want to, you know, run their events. And that's all good. They all mean well. But what I'm saying is I've noticed there's a trend, and, and Bernard does that too. They kind of go gentle on stuff. Like Bernard says, minimize oils. No, be like McDougal and Esselstein and say no oil. And look, the patient doesn't have to follow it. The patient can do whatever they want, but they should know that the recommendation is zero, none. That's a better recommendation. There's, you know, the ocean's like a sewer. There's so much crap. Even the farm food, the farm fish are full of all kinds of contaminants. So I would have said no fish. Uh, nothing from an animal. Okay, because any animal protein increases cholesterol. T. Colin Campbell writes about that and stuff, for example. All right, um, I never hear him talk about aluminum or the guy who did most of the research on it, this guy, Christopher Exley. I never hear him talk about F-, minus, about glyphosate, about MSG, and all these other sort of brain toxins and stuff. And I know why. Because all these topics, you know, the general public is totally ignorant of these things. And when you run a business, you know, McDougal doesn't talk about this stuff either. It's sort of like, it's bad for business to criticize stuff. You might piss off industry. Industry might mess with you, send a troll to hassle you on your YouTube channel or something like that. You know, I don't have a business. I just do it as a hobby. So I think that actually empowers me. I can tell you the truth about whatever I think. I don't care. I don't I don't make 10 cents from any of this stuff. Um, I just want to try to become one of the best doctors in the world. So that energizes me to study it. And I'll try to save the pearls to the extent that's possible. Um, but these guys, and that's typical with somebody who runs a business. And I can tell you, almost all these internet nutrition expert doctors, almost none of them will go into these things. You know, <laughs> You know, estrogenics, that doesn't seem like that controversial a topic, but they won't. And they won't ever talk about religion. You know, they're out there in the land of Seventh-day Adventists. I never once heard them talk about religion. I never once heard them talk about Christianity. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists is a type of Christianity. But I also know why they probably don't do that, too. If you run a business, it's considered taboo. That if you talk about your religion, it's being exclusionary. So almost no one does, even though religion is shown to be one of the most important things for improving health. You look at all the blue zones, they all got some form of religion. It helps keep their families together, their communities together. So what I'm trying to say is, I know they kind of have to for running a business, but it's almost a little hypocritical that you're going to talk about community, but not talk about religion or Christianity, okay? The main thing that, you know, what does religion mean? It means religare, legaris, to ligate, in Latin, to tie together. And that's what 
religion does for a population. It gives them stuff in common. They go to their religious ceremony on the weekends and then have their community events related to that. That's what's held communities together all over the place for thousands of years. Okay, what else? Um, about their videos. So, like I said, there was a little bit of a disconnect between their videos and their blog. You know, both of them are highly educated. They got they tr completed training in neurology. You did some extra fellowships. So you go to their blog, and that's recognizable. They got all this information on their blog, and that's good. Okay, but then you watch their videos, and it's like they're talking to an uh, like a, a bunch of morons for an IQ audience of about ninety, where they almost don't go into any type of sophisticated detail. I'm telling them, you guys, you Dr. Shurzai, if you ever watch this. You guys could make a lot of good videos about your blogs. Why don't you do that? Um, let's see what else. Because a lot of their videos, you know, they might be good. I think their videos, like when I make a video, I, I will hopefully, you know, have, I enjoy my audience and I know my audience is like highly motivated, curious people, a lot of bright people looking for a more advanced pathophysiology in their lectures. Whereas, you know, they're probably like running their business and they're just talking to like an average audience of clueless people. Uh, but you know, like I said, their, their videos to me seemed a little bit like Andrew Uberman, you know, the Stanford guy who's like information desert, you know, you think all oh, your audience is clueless. You don't tell them much information. Okay. Um, what else do I think? Um, so, you know, they know more than the average neurologist. They certainly do, but they don't put enough of that into their videos. And that's why I found their videos largely kind of boring. Um, uh, but I could see that they've got the capacity to make their videos a lot more interesting by taking the information from their blog count. So that's what I would recommend they do. I would tell people if you want to study dementia, you can learn a lot from reading their blogs and the links on their blogs. But it's easier to just watch a video than than read uh, somebody's blogs. Um, so that's my take on them. I think they are doing some good things and they've got a lot of potential and skill and stuff. But world's leading experts of Alzheimer's. Nah, I know more than they do about Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment. I don't even think it's close. Maybe they do, but they're not. They're certainly not sharing it with the public in their videos. Um, so anyways, there it is. So I know I'm a little jealous, but there it is.